Hello, everyone. We get started. This panel is on theory and method. We're still we're missing one. Oh, here she comes. So uh, please keep your questions uh, concise. Um, help us out. Help us get through a bunch of questions because I think this is a shorter session, about thirty minutes long. Could you comment on the uh, idea of there being a savings glut such that there are no more productive opportunities for investment? Like, what would that look like? What would be the implications of that? Or is that even possible? The, uh, savings glut was a way that Bernanke tried to explain the very low interest rates that occurred d during the um, run-up to the global financial crisis. And what he said was that the, the saving in Japan and elsewhere was so great that it moved through capital markets. They invested a lot of it in, in the U.S. and that pushed down interest rates in the United States, causing um, these asset bubbles. P people would borrow and, and buy houses. Um, they would refinance their houses and use them as, as ATM machines, basically to buy, to, to buy luxury goods. Um, so it was really just a, a made-up theory to, to cover the fact that the Fed was pumping money in, in, into, into the economy. Um, so th th that's my take on it. Does anyone else want to just? Yeah. I, I actually looked at the uh, figures for capital, for direct, direct foreign investment by Chinese um, traders in America. And I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but if you look at the chart, it, it started in 2000, I think. You look at the chart, and it's, it's very small. The figure's very small. Again, I don't remember the numbers. And then, and then they just balloon. But when they balloon, it's like 2015. So, so <laughs> it's clearly, clearly the evidence doesn't even support the claim that there was something like a Chinese, you know, this flood of Chinese uh, uh, money coming to the U.S., buying things and driving interest rates down. Question, I guess, to all of you. Um, do you think in, like, a Kuhnian paradigmatic sense, kind of like in how science shifts, um, that the inability of Austrian economics to really sort of precisely calculate when some things happen or just seem to, to do, I mean, there is, yes, this critique of math, but the, the whole inability to kind of do math in the science indicate perhaps some some failure in, in some of the assumptions or maybe work where, where work could be done sort of to further the discipline. You want to answer David? David? It's certainly right that the Austrians don't characteristically use math in their theory, but uh, I don't see, unless you don't accept the Austrian views of things, I don't see that that would be a problem if you thought that math was essential to doing economics than it would be. And, uh, I, I'm not seeing, it's, I'm slow at these things, what this has to do with uh, Thomas Kuhn's notion of a paradigm shift. It's, uh, I don't, uh, did you have any, could you say perhaps a bit more on the, Oh, all right. No yeah, yes, well, that, 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 that is the way, a, you're quite right, Joe, that is the way Kuhnian paradigm shifts occur. Do Austrians accept... We have the one over there. Do, does the Austrian school accept the existence of... Uh, Giffen goods and backwards bending supply curves, and if so, how might it be explained in a causal realist framework? Austrians believe, show that all demand curves, and I won't you know, go really explain it here, but, but all demand curves sh um, slope downward, and that's because of the law of marginal utility. And maybe Peter Klein can say something in a moment, but there is one curve. That, sh that slopes backwards, and, and that is uh, the um, uh, supply of labor curve, because it's also a demand for leisure, which slopes downward. And it, 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 depending on certain assumptions, um, it can in the real world, in other words, that very hot, for example, when uh, Muhammad Ali was the champion, um, he, he might, he might uh, uh, 
if, it, 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 at, the, at the peak of his fame, you know, like he was making 10, 20, 30 million dollars a fight. Um, it may be pro more, more profitable for him, maximize his income to fight once, once a year at 30 million than maybe six times a year at 2 million per fight. Um, so he, that's a backward bending supply curve. It has, it, it's intuitive. Um, I've written something on this, and I'll let you know what, what, what that is. Like I don't... Yeah, I have a, a short comment <clears throat> uh, that I can send you as well on Giffen Goods. The, 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 the example described by Joe does not, uh, it, it, it's not explained through the same mechanism as the standard textbook Giffen Good model which depends on the Marshallian uh, construction of demand. So in causal realist analysis, we don't distinguish between separate substitution effects and income effects, which you need to generate the Giffen good in the sort of standard textbook model. So for reasons that we can d discuss later, the Austrian model starts from a completely different set of assumptions about what demand is, what preferences are, how preferences are expressed in demand than uh, the textbook model. So it's not really possible to generate a, a demand curve that slopes the wrong way for the same reasons that you get in the textbook. I was wondering if you could, if you, um, could comment on the fundamental problems with the with Friedman's aim in his paper, um, I think it's called methodology of the positivist economics. Not so much on its on its applications, but on the very I guess motivations for it. Uh, well, I think one thing uh, Friedman has a, a mistaken or questionable assumption there. Uh, Roderick Long is one who's written on this that. Friedman says uh, in economic theory, we have to use uh, assumptions that aren't completely true because whenever we have an assumption of, uh, of whatever kind, we're leaving material out. So all abstractions are necessarily incomplete. And what he's really overlooking is that although it's true that uh, a statement can will omit certain details of phenomena, it's that doesn't prevent its being completely true. Uh, it isn't required that a, to have a true statement that it uh, mirror every detail of reality. If I say, for example, there are more than 50 people in this room, whether that's true or not, if that's true, that isn't uh, made less true or not completely true because it omits various details about each person in the room. You asked about the motivation, and I think the answer is prediction. He wanted to be able to predict, and in order to conjure up a model in which you could make those sorts of predictions, you would have to have those precise inputs in there. You have to, you have to make the precisive abstractions that Long talked about. Can I respond to that with something that's slightly uh, off color? Um, <laughs> someone I know, who someone I knew who was uh, friends with Friedman and also with Karl Popper once organized a small group dinner when Popper was visiting the United States, invited uh, Milton Friedman and his wife and a few others. I wasn't present, but I heard this story from someone who was at the dinner that uh, they discussed Friedman's 1953 article uh, among other topics and the Friedmans left the dinner first and Popper turned to the host and said, that Milton Friedman, not very clever, is he? <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, so we, we've talked about uh, firms a little bit, and then today there was a larger uh, lecture on it. But I was wondering, um, my conception of firms has largely been built upon uh, Coase's works, um, up until now at least, and... 
there was no mention of that at all this entire week and uh, or any of Kosa's work. And then especially during the lecture today, it almost sounded like it was kind of, um, I guess, mutually exclusive with like, Kosa's uh, th theory of the firm. And I was just wondering uh, if Austrian theory is, actually, is mutually exclusive with that, I guess. And that's something I've wondered even before coming here, but I've never heard anyone have an answer on yeah. it. Well, can, why don't you save that question for the second panel and Pear, who gave the lecture this morning you're referring to, can address it more directly. I mean, I, I, it's worth noting that uh, both both Rothbard and Kersner expressed some sympathy with Coase's idea. In my mind, it's not really even a theory. It's just sort of a heuristic framework an analytical device for characterizing uh, the difference between transactions between firms and transactions within firms. B each of them gave a sort of an Austrian interpretation of what that, how that framework might be put into practice. But I think Pear should discuss that in more detail in the second panel. <laughs> Just a, oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, what what sorts of criticisms did the German uh, historical school offer of praxeology, and how did how was that subsequently responded to? David thought he was going to take a nap. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, that won't prevent me from answering. Uh, uh, I think the the German historicists. Uh, were questioned whether there were economic laws that were universally true. They would say, if there are economic laws, they would hold only for a specific periods. Say they would say about uh, uh, pr price theory. Uh, this might hold for the developed capitalist economy, but it doesn't apply to. Uh, societies, say, in the Middle Ages or more primitive societies, that they have different laws. So it's generally skeptical about uh, uh, universal law. So that would be their, their main criticism, I would say. Uh, my question is more on the direction of how we understand market efficiency, because we do we, we believe that markets do not achieve equilibrium, and we also say that markets do achieve a plain state of rest every time a market price is determined. And my question is more on the sense that can we affirm any efficiency properties to markets other than market clearing? Can we say that markets are efficient in a sense other than just establishing prices that showcase or in location of goods that satisfy marginal utilities? Yeah, that, that's a great question, and the answer is absolutely. Um, uh, the economist W.H. Hutt, who was sort of a quasi-Austrian, um, had a notion called price coordination. And what markets do at any moment in time, if you look at the present um, prices of the factors of production, land, labor, capital, and so on, all different types of labor, all of those reflect the um, judgments and estimations of entrepreneurs of, of the future um, values or, or more marginal value products of those things. So markets are always generating price coordination. The entrepreneurs who believe they have the best uses or, or that, that they can judge the future conditions better than others and, and bid a higher price for, for, for these things are at that moment se setting up a scale of uses of those things. So that's, in a way, a sort of a dynamic efficiency, um, if you will. Uh, so it's often said in Austrian circles that the empiricists claim that for a statement to be meaningful, it must be empirically verifiable. Uh, what's an empiricist response to that Austrian argument? Peter's an empiricist. Oh, I see. <laughs> so the, the argument, the, uh, which specific argument did you, oh, which was the specific argument that you wanted, the 
is Pierce's response to which specific argument? The argument that for a claim to be meaningful, it must be empirically verifiable. Oh, yes, that, that's the empiricist claim. So you want to know what would be the Austrian? Oh, OK. So the Austrian response that that isn't in and of itself empirically verifiable? Oh, the, their uh, well, they had several different responses to that. The, the one that seemed to uh, come out, become popular most later when this criticism was raised, uh, was that their the uh, empiricist uh, statement should not be taken as a statement, but just as a proposal that didn't have a real truth value, we say, if you want to proceed uh, scientifically, you should adopt this proposal. So they would say, uh, that isn't, it isn't an analytic statement, it isn't empirical, but its uh, proposals aren't regular statements, so it would be immune to the self-refutation claim. Of course, the counter to, to that is, well, if it's a proposal, uh, why should we adopt it? This is kind of directed to everyone or, or anyone, but um, do you have a dominant argument or strategy for uh, convincing neoclassicals that we are correct? I, I mentioned in my lecture that uh, a, a lot of the, the common arguments that Austrians make against neoclassicals actually have, the neoclassicals have escape hatches, like the ordinality of preferences. So they, they just they back up a little bit and say, yeah, we, we can handle ordinal preferences because we can just shift the utility function to represent any set of preferences. Therefore, we aren't, even though we do have a number associated with a certain level of utility, it's, it's, still, it's still ordinal because we can shift it any direction that we want to. So it can reflect any, any set of preferences. So I think, th I think those sorts of attacks aren't as... Uh, um, uh, what's the word? They aren't as effective as, as we might think. Uh, hello. What are some of the key? Yeah. <laughs> what I was going to say is um, I think our best strategy is to do good economics <laughs> and to show the mainstream that they should be doing good economics by the example of the power of, uh, our, of our analysis. Hello again. What are some of the key differences between Hayek and Rothbard? Height. <laughs> um, one was that they spoke different dialects of English. Um, I was at a conference once, and Murray Rothbard was giving a talk, and at the end of the talk, Hayek was we were standing talking to Hayek and he he turned to us and he says I can't understand one word that man says <laughs> so it's Murray's New York Jewish dialect versus Hayek's sort of British German <laughs> dialect anyone have a more substantive <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was substantive yeah. <laughs> what would be a good reading Joe your dehomogenization stuff yeah, um, I, I think you, you should read Hayek's Economics and Knowledge and his Use of Knowledge in Society, too. One's, the first one's 1937, and the uh, second one is, is that 45? 45, yeah. And then um, read Rothbard's The Present State of Austrian Economics, in which it's late in his life, but he's, he's, he's been exposed to the dehomogenization debate and he thought more about Hayek because he initially accepted a lot of the things about uh, that Hayek said, but he thought that they were sort of just extra glosses on Mises, that, that they, they, they helped to extend Mises. But, but he, he kind of rejects that in his later article, The Present State of Austri Austrian Economics, which is in Economic Controversies. 
I would like to know how much of a reality do you think the BRICS currency is going to be and what do you think we can expect from it? it it's, it's a government scheme. I mean, it's at best, it would be a watered-down gold standard. Um, and at worst, it would just be sort of a, a cover for um, them inflating in unison. So uh, I, I don't think much of it. I haven't looked really closely at the plan. I, I, I do like it because it, it, it's trying to, br at least the aim, the stated aim is, is to break the dominance of the U.S. dollar and, 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 and to effectively decrease demand to hold dollars in a world economy, which, which would then push our interest rates up. Um, and it, it would cause... The, the Fed would have to become tighter if the BRICS currency actually came to fruition and was used. I mean, have, uh, you covered one. it. No, you, yeah. okay. you covered it in, in, in the sense that um, the upside of the BRICS and the BRIC proposal and the BRIC bank and the BRIC, BRIC currency is in opposition to the U.S. dollar and the dominance and the monopoly that the Fed enjoys. And, you know, it's... We're exporting inflation. We're exporting business cycles. Um, and these other countries, which are growing um, and expanding, uh, and they want the political influence that a leading monetary system would give them. So it's, it's political, but it's political against the U.S. dollar and the, and the federal and the Federal Reserve and its dominance. So uh, it does have sort of a political upside to it. An increasingly uh, kind of a wing of uh, modern right wingism kind of offers a critique of Austrianism where they say, okay, yeah, maybe you're right, but what if we want our society to be poorer and more, uh, but uh, like we don't want these amoral or immoral things. Uh, is that kind of a short-sighted response? What, what would be, uh, how, how would you respond to that? Well, anybody can, um, you know, lower their standard of living and uh, stop working for, you know, give up their job and move into the wilderness and be by themselves and, you know, set up their own camp out in the wilderness. Um, you can do that today. Um, now, the problem, of course, occurs. The problem, of course, occurs if if somebody, some political force, wants to inf mandate that for everyone, mandate lower standards of living, mandate uh, certain behaviors, um, symbols, and so forth. And you're talking kind of like a form of fascism, basically, uh, which is socialism, and which it you know gives the state an incredible amount of power over people's lives and the economy. I mean, if you think about HOAs, the same sort of thing happens. People like voluntarily go into these neighborhoods knowing that there's going to be restrictions on the way that they use their property. So this is open to pretty much all of you. Uh, where would you say Rothbard went wrong? We're not a cult, right? <laughs> so, I mean, one of the great things, even in the past summers that I've been here as a fellow, is uh, is being able to talk with uh, with scholars like Salerno and actually talking through differences between Mises and Rothbard. So, like this, there's this is not a monolithic sort of thing. There are differences between these economists. Uh, sometimes it's as simple as I think I think Mises could have been more clear here. I think Rothbard. Uh, he, he took this slightly different approach to explain the same sort of thing compared to Mises, and sometimes there are even larger differences between them. So it's it's not uh, it's not like a great sin to to point out issues. In fact, you should always have your critical thinking uh, yeah, yeah, engaged and, while you're reading. And one can embrace a general approach and sort of uh, you know philosophical system, a way of doing economics, while still working out some of the details and for example uh, Rothbard uh, his treatment in his theory of the firm of what he calls the decision-making factor and actually Joe has a piece on this too that I think is completely wrong but I haven't had a chance <laughs> I haven't had a chance to write up why I think it's wrong but uh, you know there's some there are also some inconsistencies in the early parts of man economy and state uh, his supply and demand analysis um, there's some I think there's some minor details that are wrong in terms of how he derives the demand curve um, 
you know, I don't think these things have a huge impact on Rothbard's overall kind of, you know, economic system. But yeah, of course, there's always room for rethinking and questioning and looking at details, both substantive and also expositional. Yeah, and I just wanted to say, um, Patrick Newman and I are writing a, a, a book on, on, on Rothbard's writing of Man, Economy, and State and how he developed in the very act of writing it over a course of six years into an Austrian economist. And um, the one thing that was, is clear to us is that the, he didn't have professional economists reading the chapters as he went along. He didn't have, um, because people, you know, he was writing on a, a, a very small or, or a, a school of thought. He's writing in the tradition of a school of thought where there are hardly any, any economists. So he didn't get, he didn't get high level feedback. That he was, the people that read his chapters were, were lay people who sort of knew economics. So there are, are minor details where, where I would disagree with him, but the overall approach is correct. And what's really amazing is the fact that he actually did what Mises talked about, but never really did, because Mises assumed you had a lot of knowledge. He derived the whole of economic theory, um, the main propositions from the action axiom. I mean, his deduction, it's very difficult to find any logical errors in that deduction. So um, I, I think whatever problems th there may have been, and there are a few here and there, um, I, I think it was, his achievement was overwhelming. I'm going to um, answer that question a little differently, assuming that what, by, what you mean by that is where did he go wrong with his career? And, you know, because uh, Murray graduated from the number one economics program with a Ph.D., number one program in the world, really, uh, under the leading professors of economics in the profession at the time. Um, he published, uh, you know, some amazing stuff, including Man, Economy, and State uh, in America's Great Depression early in his career, plus the Panic of 1819, which was critically acclaimed. He published... Uh, um, articles and comments in the American Economic Review. He was sending things to the Journal of Political Economy and publishing in other leading journals. Um, so he was on the highway to a lot of professional prestige uh, that comes, he was uh, under consideration for an appointment at the University of Chicago. He knew and corresponded with some of the leading people in the profession like James Buchanan and Gordon Tullock, uh, Sam Peltzman, just a bunch of people that I couldn't possibly make up the entire list. But he went on to do other things that were professionally dangerous, like uh, developing libertarian theory, uh, like uh, developing a sustained attack on central banking, um, things that were professionally um, during the Cold War and, and the, the rise of the central bank were not popular at all within the profession because of political pressure against that. So, you know, professionally, he suffered a great deal as a result of those decisions. But frankly, we should all thank God that he did it. Um, and, uh, you know, I think one of the things that the, the panel was a little bit hesitant when the question was asked is because, you know, we've been following Rothbard's path and uh, it's not an easy path to follow professionally. There's a lot of easier paths that these people up here uh, that have been teaching you all week, they could have taken other paths uh, to higher heights and easier circumstances. Um, so if you think that's... Um, where Rothbard went wrong, we disagree. Thanks, everyone. Next panel's in here momentarily.